Hey you guys, gals and bumps. Welcome back to A Few Bad Men. Today's episode, we got Johnny Spanish and Kid Dropper. If you don't know these guys, these guys are from the early part of the 20th century, before the 20s, all right, before Prohibition. These guys were Lower East Side gangsters, okay? All right, but, but, but before we get started into the video, all right, in case you guys didn't see the video I, I put up the other day, the announcement, all right, first of all, I want to say thank you guys for, for getting me to 1,000 subscribers if you didn't hear that, okay? Thank you, that's first of all. Second of all, I got the merch store open, all right? A lot of you guys say you want wanted to, you wanted some shirts and stuff. I got it for you, okay? You need to go to afbm gear.com. All right. There you can get the exclusive A Few Bad Men gear. I got some great shirts up there. I got a few coffee mugs up there for you guys. All right. Go check it out. Also, you can follow me on Instagram at afbm underscore gear. All right. If you buy something, you know, I would love to see. If you if you tag me in the video in your picture or something and, and let me see you guys wearing this, wearing the gear. Now make sure you stay tuned to the end of the video where I'll be giving away a t-shirt. Okay, so stay tuned, watch the whole video at the end. You get and I'm gonna have a contest so you guys can win a t-shirt, alright? So unfortunately, there are no verified photographs of Johnny Spanish. Okay. But he is described by the admissions clerk at Sing Sing as being five foot four and three quarters inches tall, weighing 132 pounds. He was slim and the wardens mistakenly thought he may have been tubercular. Johnny was described as having a dark complexion with dark brown eyes and dark brown hair. His hat size was six and seven eighths. His shoe size was six. His forehead normal, ears small and irregular. Eyebrows arched and medium. Nose, short and small. Mouth, medium. Lips, medium. Teeth, three absent. General features, regular. He had a one-inch scar that ended with a hole near his cheek. Johnny Spanish was born Giovanni Mistretta in 1889, most likely in Lower Manhattan, to an Italian father and a Spanish mother. He had at least two siblings, all right? Antoinette and Antonio and a younger brother named Giuseppe. They called him Joey. Johnny was a bright kid, okay? He was able to read and write well and as an adult, he was able to speak fluent Italian, Spanish, and English. Even though he was smart and, and did well in school, he found his way into the streets. Johnny had a short fuse, okay? It led to a lot of fights in the streets when he was a kid. All right. Even though he was a small guy, he was tough. He fought with ferocity. All right. He attacked his, his enemies like a like a Wolverine. They said it seemed like he suffered some from some type of depression. All right, because he would he would brood over his troubles, real and imaginary. Okay. For several years, he kept strictly to himself, operating as an independent thug, and accepting commissions from all who would pay his price. It said that Johnny never made a move without two revolvers stuck in his belt. And when he was on important errands, he carried two more stuffed into his coat pockets. Besides his regulation equipment of a blackjack and brass knuckles. Now sometime between 1905 and 1906, Johnny joined the Five Points Gang. Okay, Started off small, pickpocket in the streets and the trolleys. Then he graduated up to burglary and armed robbery. Now, because he had a Latin heritage, they started calling him Spanish John. All right, his five points gang. They started calling him Spanish John. And before long, it, it, it transposed to Johnny Spanish. Okay, and then, now his little brother, Giuseppe, Joey, soon he became a part of the gang and they started calling him Joey Spanish. Sometime early on in his five point career, Johnny was shot in the face and had three teeth knocked out. That's what gave him that ugly scar on his cheek that we mentioned earlier. By 1909, Johnny was 20 years old and he had a gang of mostly Jewish thieves on the Lower East Side. Him and his brother Joey began to use the alias of Wheeler. 
most likely to, to shield their family from the shame of their criminal activities. So along with Joey, some of the guys in Johnny's gang were Hyman Benjamin, Lefty Cantor, and a guy who would end up being the death of Johnny, Nathan Kid Dropper Kaplan. One of seven children, Nathan Kaplan was born August 3rd, 1891. According to his elementary school principal, Nathan was well behaved and was promoted quite regularly and even skipped the grade level. <laughs> his first arrest came on September 16, 1903, just three months after his promotion to the fifth grade when he was pulled in as a suspicious person after trying to sell a pair of shoes. He told the police that another boy had given him the shoes and he was discharged. Now, the kid got his name Dropper because he ran a drop game, drop swindle, okay? What he would do is he would take a wallet with some counterfeit bills in it and he would drop it next to the foot of a person on a trolley or outside of something. And then he would ask the person, uh, listen, could you take this? I found this wallet. Could you take this back to the person who owns it? Give me a couple of dollars and you take it and then they'll give you a reward knowing that the person is going to know there's money in there and they're going to be greedy and they're going to let their greed take over them and give him a few dollars and then he'd step off and go off and they'd walk around the corner and look and see they got counterfeit dollars all right so that's the drop scheme or drop drop swindle kid dropper grew up just like johnny in poverty on the low east side stealing from push carts and unsuspecting passerbys Nathan was able to stay out of the hands of the police until his teens. On February 11, 1908, he was arrested as a general thief and discharged. About two years later, on January 27, 1910, he was caught with a concealed weapon but came away with a suspended sentence. By the time he was 20, he was in the Spanish gang. And along with Johnny and the rest of the guys, they were terrorizing the Lower East Side. So in 1909, as labor unions started forming in the United States, all right, companies started hiring thugs to act as strike breakers and discourage union activity. So, so Johnny and his boys got into the labor slugging business. Okay, now, now at the same time, companies were, were hiring thugs to break strikes. The unions were hiring muscle of their own to protect striking workers and prevent the strikes for being broken. This is what Johnny and his guys did, okay? And in the autumn of 1909, they were hired by the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory to break a strike. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located at the northwest corner of Green Street and Washington Place in Greenwich Village. It took up the eighth, ninth, and 10th floors of the Ash Building. It had about 500 workers, most of them immigrant women who worked long hours sewing blouses. They used to call them shirtwaist back then. They worked extremely long hours under crowded and unsafe conditions. The plant's owner, Max Blank, and his partner, Isaac Harris, regularly locked and chained the doors of the business in order to prevent the workers' death and unexcused absences. In November of 1909, the Triangle workers began to protest the inhumane working conditions and started to unionize. This caused the management to lock out the bulk of the plant's workforce, roughly 500 workers. Out on the picket line, the seamstresses were picketing out front of the Ash Building, joined by the members of the Women's Trade Union League, there to show solidarity and help them organize. The women were threatened by police who were friendly to the Triangle management and they told the girls they would find themselves jailed if they didn't get out of here. So this is where Johnny and his guys come in. They were hired to break this strike. So every day, they were out there verbally abusing and occasionally physically assaulting the strikers. One, one picketeer named Andy Pardwin filed a complaint against one of Johnny's guys. His name was Morris Goldfarb. She said he rushed up to her and slammed her against the wall near the shop and struck her with his fist at the same time he exercised his vocabulary to its limits. Johnny was also accused of assaulting one of the locked out workers, a guy named Joe Zeinfeld. Johnny beat Zeinfeld so severely he had to be hospitalized. Some of the picketeers saw, saw this and they tried to call for the cops and Johnny ran off. 
it said that he was caught down the road by a cop on a horse and he had a few words with the cop and the cop let him walk off. Eventually, the strike was settled and it was back to business as usual at the factory, doing no small part to the labor slugging of Johnny and his guys. 16 months later, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory caught fire and 146 workers were killed. This shed light to the world of the inhumane employment practices of the plant owners. On November 13, 1909, Johnny got his name in the papers for the first time because on Wednesday, November 10th, a few bandits held up the Jefferson Cartery Club on Henry Street. Okay. Seems like Johnny and his guys were the victims in this. Okay, because they went out to get retaliation the very next night. So this is 1909, okay? Horse-drawn carriages, there are more horse-drawn carriages than there are cars on the road right now, okay? So back then, if you didn't own a car, there were garages around the city that would rent autos to, to trustworthy individuals for a short period, you know, like a rental place now, okay? But it's unclear if this is how Johnny acquired them, but somehow Johnny and his guys got their hands on three taxi cab automobiles. So now they were mobile and out looking for revenge, fueled by alcohol and cocaine. At around 8.30 that Thursday evening, the three cabs came to a stop on Broom Street. Johnny and about a dozen of his guys jumped out of cars and began visiting the saloons like they were looking for someone. All right. And at Grand and Pitt Streets, they came across Assemblyman Aaron Levy, who was speaking to a judge at the time. And then all of a sudden, shots rang out, sending the assemblyman and the judge running for cover. All right. Johnny and his guys proceeded to shoot up the windows and street lamps before jumping into their cars and taking off. Later on, around midnight, they showed up at a, a saloon owned by a guy named Max Schnur and shot the place up. They terrorized the customers and, and shot up all the mirrors behind the bar. Two guys, Mike Kalinsky and Sam Klein, received minor wounds in the attack. The cops rounded up all the usual suspects from all over Lower Manhattan that night, including Jake Siegel, AKA Kid Jigger, and a guy named William Albert, soon to be infamously known as Big Jack Zelly. So after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory and the taxi cab incidents, Johnny started to get a name for himself in the underworld. So he began to expand into other records. He, he let it be known that him and his guys were available for freelance muscle work, as well as burglaries and armed robbery, in addition to the labor slavery. Okay. Johnny also had a couple of street walking girls work for him. Okay. One one's name was Millie Cohen, and she, she worked the area between 28th Street and 6th Avenue. Another girl whose name is unknown, she worked downtown in the vicinity of Monroe and Jefferson Streets. Now, there was this card game that was played in uh, the back rooms and saloons in, the, in, in New York and in Chicago in the Jewish communities, all right? Now, this, this card game was called Stuss, or Jewish Pharaoh, all right? And it entailed the cards being dealt by the dealer from the hand, not from a shoe. Apparently, in Pharaoh, you deal from a shoe. I don't know. Guys, leave it in the comment if you know anything about it, all right? Also, the house wins all the money when drawing two equal cards, as opposed to half in traditional pharaoh. This greatly increased the house advantage over its patrons. Right? Now, Stuss, like I said, was played in the late teens, the late 19th century, early 20th century, in, in ethnic neighborhoods, New York and Chicago. So, Johnny began to muscle in on these underground Stuss games. He would approach these Stuss operators and demand a substantial percent of their, their daily earnings under the penalty of death. His success in the underworld enabled him to buy a new house for his family at 31 Lexington Avenue, an up and coming section of, of Queens called Masspeth. Johnny moved his family out to the house, all right? His, his older sister, Antonetta, and her husband, Paul, and his, his mother, Rose, and his brother, Joey. In 1910, Johnny Spanish fell in love. He fell hard for an attractive 19-year-old girl named Beatrice Constance. Now, 
Johnny had a burning desire to, to lavish his girl with silks and precious stones. And, and it was this desire that eventually got her bumped off. I'll tell you how. But first, Johnny had to settle an internal conflict within his own gang. Two of his guys got into a fight. A guy named Charles Mannheimer stabbed a fellow gangster known as the Kid, probably Kid Dropper, several times. Now, now as the Kid was recovering, this guy, Mannheimer, was in the wind. He avoided all of his usual spots. But on the evening of May 25th, Johnny and Kid Dropper caught up with their wayward comrade on the corner of Norfolk and Hester Street. And shots rang out. Mannheim got a bullet in his back and it shattered his spine. He was rushed to the hospital, severely wounded. And he growled, if I don't get a wooden overcoat, I'll get the man who shot me without help from you bulls. But on June 12th, the 23 year old gangster Charles Mannheimer died of his wound. Soon after the Norfolk attack, Johnny was out to get some, some money. He needed some money for his new girl, all right? So he thought of a stuss game, obviously, all right? The one he thought about was run by a guy named Kid Jigger on Forsyth Street between Hester and Grand, one of the most prosperous on the east side, all right? Kid Jigger bore a wide reputation as a gunfighter and the gangsters respected his prowess and left him in peace. But Johnny was blinded by love and avarice and Johnny was undeterred by Jigger's reputation. So on the evening of May 29th, Johnny showed up at Kid Jigger's game in Forsyth Street between Hester and Grand with a guy named Hyman Benjamin. Johnny calmly demanded half of the Jigger's profits from the Stuss games. But he told Jigger that he could continue to do all the hard work of running the games. The Jigger responded, and why do I give you half of my Stuss graph? Johnny said, because if you don't, I'll bump you off and take it all. Jigger laughed long and loud, and Johnny glared at him balefully from his brooding black eyes. All right, he said, I'll bump you off tomorrow night. After Johnny and Benjamin left, Kid Jigger armed himself with a cheap 32 caliber revolver. And then he exited his game into the spring night and headed north to the intersection of Forsyth and Grand Street. But Johnny Spanish and Hyman Benjamin were waiting on the corner. After a brief conversation with the gang boss, Jigger stepped back and reached for his pistol. He managed to get one shot off before taking off for cover. While he was running, one of, one of Johnny's guys emptied a pistol at him. One of those bullets hit a 13-year-old girl named Rachel Rootin in the abdomen as she was walking by. She went down screaming and Johnny and his guys made their escape. She was rushed to the hospital as the police started to investigate. All right. Now, Kid Jigger eventually fell into the hands of the police and he claimed that it was Johnny Spanish and Hyman Benjamin who, who, who did the shooting on the corner. All right, he said it was explicitly that it was Benjamin who tried to kill him and accidentally shot the young girl. Now, the young Rachel Wooten succumbed to her wounds on June 11th and passed away with two public murders accredited to his name. There was a citywide manhunt out for Johnny. So Johnny skipped town. He left behind his kingdom and his girlfriend Beatrice Constance. He laid low in Detroit for the summer of 1910. But when he returned to New York in September, he was shocked when he discovered that his love Beatrice had hooked up with one of his cheap underlings, Kid Dropper Kaplan. And Johnny's broken heart demanded immediate vengeance. So on the evening of Friday, September 23rd, 1910, the kid was walking through the Lower East Side. It's unsure if he knew that Johnny knew about him and Beatrice, but it didn't matter because the kid didn't see Johnny Spanish coming that day. As he neared the corner of Jefferson and Monroe Street, Johnny darted out of nowhere and opened fire. The bullet struck Kid Dropper in the neck before moving upward through his mouth and took the remains of four upper teeth with it as it exited his cheek. Johnny ran off, probably thinking that he had killed the kid. But the bullet hadn't severed any vital arteries or veins and it looked worse than it actually was. A cop asked the kid who shot him 
He said, Johnny Spanish. He goggled, threw his bullet down his mouth, and the call went out to get Johnny Spanish, who was just getting started for the night. Now, back in Mesbeth, Johnny was seen getting off of a trolley with his girl, Beatrice. They were seen arguing. And then they saw Johnny grab her by the wrist, jab the barrel of a gun against her gut, and pull the trigger twice. She let out a scream as Johnny looked around, and then he took off, hopped over some fences, and sprinted across the fields of Maspeth. A police officer was, was summoned, and they found Beatrice still alive but severely wounded. When they asked her who shot her, she said, I'd rather die. But later on in the hospital, when she was told that she was gonna die, she said, John Wheeler shot me. And then soon realized that she was talking about Johnny Spanish, who usually used the alias of Wheeler. All right, so, so check this out. This is, this is the legend, all right? The legend says that at the time Johnny shot her, that Beatrice was pregnant with Kid Dropper's kid. All right, and after she was shot, she had a kid who was missing two fingers that was apparently, apparently shot off by Johnny Spanish, all right? But that's just the, the legend, all right? There's no evidence that she was pregnant when she was shot, but that's Herbert Asbury's Gangs of New York, creating legends. Now, somehow, Johnny was never charged for the shooting of Kid Dropper or Beatrice Constance. Now, that December, the trial for Hyman Benjamin for killing the, the Rachel Rutten started. And Johnny was in the courtroom initially, and he, he was intimidating Kid Jigger. Kid Jigger took the stand and told the court that he was afraid for his life. But later on, Johnny was laying low because of the Kaplan and the Beatrice shootings, and he wasn't in the courtroom. So Kid Jigger said that, that it was Johnny Spanish who was no longer in the courtroom who fired the shots that hit the rooting girl. And it was Benjamin who had grabbed his arm in an attempt to stop him. Hyman Benjamin walked out of the courtroom a free man. On the Lower East Side, there was a guy, a Jewish saloon keeper. His name was Morris or Max Miller. Okay, he ran a spot at uh, 107th Norfolk Street, a tavern. All right, he was known as Moisha the strong arm in the Jewish underworld. But Johnny didn't care about anybody's reputation. If he wanted what you had, he was gonna come and take it. So on the evening of March 18th, 1911, at about 11.30 p.m., Johnny and one of his guys, Jaime Cohen, entered the saloon owned by Morris Miller. Johnny approached the bartender, who happened to be Morris Miller's brother, Isidore, and he told him he wanted to see Morris. And he said Morris wasn't in. And then Cohen said, tell him he's his brother. Johnny said, quote, F you, I don't want to talk to you. I want to see your brother. So then Johnny tried to get the bartender to hand him over $10, and Isidore refused to do so. Johnny and Cohen said that they would be back that evening to clean the place out. About an hour later, Johnny reappeared with two guys and, and his pistols drawn. He told the 15 patrons to, to put their hands up. Then he told his, his guys to go through the crowd. They got about $200 worth of valuables and cash and watches from the, from the customers. All right. Now at this point, Isidore called Johnny over to the bar and offered him 10 bucks. He said, here, here Johnny, take this and be quiet. To which the gangster replied, you go to hell. I'll go behind the bar and take it all. Then Johnny went behind the bar and relieved the, the enraged Moisture strong, Moisture the strong arm of his prize gold watch before snatching $68 out of the till. While backing out of the saloon, he crossed his pistols and told everybody that he was gonna shoot the bartender for luck. When Spanish fired, Isidore ducked for safety. Johnny said good night and left. Johnny was subsequently arrested for the robbery and went on trial on July 13th. All right. Now, according to the press, he showed up for court tastefully dressed as for a gala event in good taste, not the cheap flashy clothes usually affected by the sports of his class. His mother sat behind him in the courtroom and his sweetheart, Mildred Rose, originally from Detroit, she paced outside in the hallway. She couldn't bring herself to watch the proceedings. After the first day, Mother Wheeler left the courtroom and broke into tears while Mildred tried to console her. On the second day of the trial, 
with overwhelming evidence against Johnny. His lawyer informed the court that his client wished to change his plea of not guilty to guilty of robbery in the first degree. The court asked Johnny to plead, suffering or faking a tubercular fit. And it said that he was tubercular. He rose unsteadily and said, I plead guilty, Your Honor. Very well, the judge replied. I'm ready for you. You're one of the most miserable and contemptible characters that it has ever been my misfortune to see. Were you a well man, I should give you the stiffest sentence in the power of the court to impose. But I don't think you're long for this world. Then too, you're still pretty young and much of a youngster. He was 21 at the time. So I'm going to give you a moderate sentence. From what I hear of your condition, I don't think you'll ever tr trouble anyone again. Seven years and 10 months in Sing Sing. Now, earlier that year, on January 26, okay, Kid Dropper and some of his guys entered into a West Side whorehouse and robbed the women at gunpoint and threatened to kill anyone who made a noise. While a crime was in progress, the kid ripped $86 from one of the girl's stockings. The bandits escaped only to be arrested a short time later. And because the dropper physically removed the money from the woman's stocking, assault was added to the charge of robbery. And a sentence of seven to 10 years was handed down. Dropper was sent to Sing Sing, where he no doubt mixed with Johnny Spanish when Johnny got there. But the kid's lawyer was able to finagle him out of his original charge and he didn't have to serve all the time on his sentence. He got out before Johnny Spanish. While Johnny was locked up, the kid began to rise in the, in the Jewish underworld. Even after he was arrested and sent back to jail in 1914 for bigamy, it was clear to see that Kid Dropper was, was, was getting much bigger than Johnny Spanish. And Johnny could only look with envy from jail. When Johnny was released in 1917, he came back to a, a different world than, than the one he left, all right? He was now 28, all right? Cars were big. There was a lot more traffic, a lot more cars in the streets than when he left. And uh, the Queens neighborhood, Masbeth, where, where he, he had his family, was being built up. All right, when he was there, it was a lot of open fields. It wasn't too developed. When he got back, it was a lot of houses and everything. It was a neighborhood now. Johnny got back to, back to his old haunts and put his reputation of use on the streets. All right, with, with his brother Joey back at his side, they started to uh, make a little noise. But the underworld had changed since he went away. All right, there was different guys in, in charge. There was a guy named Arnold Rothstein. Okay, you may have heard of him. Another guy was Jacob Organ, known as Little Augie. Now, now Little Augie followed Dopey Benny Fine as the leader of the Lower East Side Underworld. It seems that uh, Johnny made a deal with Little Augie to operate independently and not infringe on his territory. Johnny and his brother got back into the labor slugging business, but so he also got into the the cocaine selling business because he was a user and a dealer before he went away and now the cocaine was illegal him and his brother became perhaps the biggest dealers of the drugs on the lower east side during world war one kid dropper was released from his bigamy charge in uh december 1917 okay and that, like i said he had a higher standard in the underworld than johnny at this time but then it seems that they agreed to peaceably coexist in the underworld. Uh, Arnold Rothstein may have even been brought in to mediate. But in the summer of 1919, it seemed like the longtime beef between Johnny and Kid Dropper was on the verge of bubbling over. All right, Johnny was starting to, to make some money. He was getting about $100 a week for, for slugging activities. And Dropper was trying to get his hands on a large percentage of it. Johnny even had his self elected as a shirtwaist labor delegate so he could control the unions from the inside. Prohibition was right around the corner and the gangsters in New York were, were readying themselves for the windfall. But Johnny wouldn't be around to take part in it. July 29th was a Tuesday. It was hot and humid in New York. The temperature was 91 degrees and Johnny had agreed to meet his wife at Levitt's restaurant 
at 19 Second Avenue at four o'clock that afternoon. Johnny arrived in a cab a little after four that day, dressed in an expensive summer suit and a straw boater. Johnny navigated his way across Second Avenue toward Levitt's. Parked outside was his expensive touring car driven by Philip Rockin, which meant that his wife was waiting for him inside. As Johnny approached the restaurant door, he was stopped in his tracks by Kid Dropper, who stood in the restaurant door, flanked by two of his goons, Herman Jaime Kalman and Billy the Kid Lustig. The two rivals spoke briefly, and then Kid Dropper pulled the revolver. Johnny was frozen. He didn't try to run or draw a gun of his own. The kid shot. The first bullet struck him in the heart and caused him to stagger before falling face down onto the sidewalk. Then the kid stood over him and fired a second bullet into the back of his head, which sent passers by screaming and yelling and running. Then the drop in two of his guys was seen casually walking around the corner and disappearing into the crowd. Johnny's wife and Philip Rockin ran out of the restaurant. They piled Johnny's body into Rockin's car and made it for the hospital. Johnny was still alive when he arrived at Bellevue Hospital, but he soon expired in the examining room. The police announced that they were looking for Nathan Kaplan, Herman Kalman, and Billy Lustig. Now, the latter admitted that he was at the scene, but he denied knowing who fired the fatal shots. The charges against all three men were dismissed. Now with his brother gone, Joey, Joey Spanish, was not good enough. He wasn't skilled enough to hold, to hold the gang together, the enterprises together, all right? But he was determined to get revenge for his brother. He began lurking near Kid Dropper's house at 195 Madison Street in the hopes of catching him off guard. On the evening of, of December 3rd, 1919, Joey Spanish mistook Adolf Kaplan for his brother Nathan and opened fire on him as he walked down the street with a young girl named Martha Janoff. He missed his target, but he struck Miss Janoff in the abdomen. Young Joey Spanish was captured by the police after a brief foot chase and charged with assault with intent to kill. Now, with Johnny Spanish gone and little Augie Organ doing time, Nathan Kid Dropper Kaplan was the undisputed boss on the Lower East Side. He had power and wealth beyond his wildest dreams, but it didn't last long because little Augie was back on the streets and he had his own ideas about who should be running the Lower East Side. Now, little Augie and his guys and Kid Dropper and his guys, they were both in the labor racketeer business. And sometimes this resulted in violence when one of the gang was employed as strike breakers while the other one was provided protection for the unions. It said in one of these altercations, Kid Dropper gave little Augie the scar that's on his cheek. Little Augie later shot Kid Dropper twice in the leg in retaliation. So on August 1st, 1923, little Augie and his guys were loitering in front of a building on the Lower East Side when at 8.30 p.m. a sedan containing five of Kid Dropper's men pulled up and shots rang out. The little Augies scattered with the exception of 27-year-old William Weiss, who was wounded in the leg and subsequently arrested. About a half hour after the shooting, Jacob Gora Shapiro was brought into the hospital with a bullet wound to the face by two men who dropped him off and hightailed it out of there in a taxi. It was this attack that will prove to be Kid Dropper's undoing. But the kid wasn't done yet. Eight days later, he murdered a little Augie henchman named Lewis Midget Lewis Schwartzman. Now, now the midget had survived the drive-by on August 1st, but this time the guns of the dropper hit their mark. Now, following that first attack, the little Augies were, were on their toes and they were keeping off of the streets. So the droppers had to resort to new tactics. So Schwartzman was dating a, a young girl named Yoski Churgin, all right? And she lived in the dropper territory, but also it's, it was said that she was one time flaming the kid himself. Now, now he knew that it was unsafe for him to visit her at her house. So Churgin 
decided to go see him. And and the, the dropper guys were waiting for this. As she walked a few blocks to Lewis' apartment, Churchill was, was oblivious to the taxi cab that was following her slowly. When she got to the apartment building, she saw a kid sitting on the stoop and, and told him to go up and get Lewis. Lewis rushed down and as he embraced her, the taxi pulled up to the curb and a half dozen shots rang out. Midget Lewis fell on the Yoski, his blood soaking her dress. All right. She was dazed for a moment and then she started screaming, call a cop, call a cop. The killers of course pulled away and made a clean escape. Now, after the murder of Midget Lewis, little Augie and his guys came up with their own plan to get the kid once and for all. First, Shapiro would break the gangster code of silence and rat out Kaplan as the man who shot him. This would force the kid to appear in court and face the charge. All right. Now they would be armed with the knowledge of where and when the kid was going to be. It was feasible that they could knock him off. All they needed was someone willing to shoot him and face the music as escape would be impossible. The little Augie's found the right fall guy, a guy named Lewis Cohen, a hanger on with aspirations of being a gangster. On August 28, 1923, the kit was brought to Essex Market Court to be identified by Shapiro. The police captain, Cornelius Williams, who was in charge, had received a, a tip that the little Augies would make an attempt on a gang leader's life. Williams stationed about 25 to 30 cops around the courthouse to keep the, to keep the public away. In preparation for his task, Cohen was coked up and given a gun, his head filled with lies about how famous he would become if he pulled off the murder. Kid Dropper and some of his gang members were ushered into the courthouse and placed in front of Shapiro for identification. Now, Cohen had never seen the kid before, so he slipped into the courtroom with another guy who was gonna point him out. And then Cohen almost shot the wrong man and, and his guy got panicky and left, all right? The court proceedings were so tedious that it bored Cohen and he stepped outside and went to a barber shop across the street. All right. Inside the courtroom, Shapiro said that he really wasn't sure who shot him after all. And then a smiling dropper emerged from the courthouse with his wife, Detective Jesse Joseph, and Captain Williams bringing up the rear. Now, across the street in the shop, somebody yells out, there goes the dropper now. Cohen walked outside and slipped into the crowd that the police were holding at bay. As the dropper approached the taxi that was gonna take him to the court on the west side where he had to answer another charge, his wife wrapped her arms around him and said, Jack, you've beaten all the other cases and you'll beat this one uptown. Then she gave him a kiss. The captain pushed her away and told her she could talk to him at the west side court. Then he ordered the driver to get behind the wheel. Detective Joseph climbed in on the left side of the cab while the dropper got into the right, sliding over to make room for Williams. Before the police captain was all the way in, Cohen slipped through the crowd, ran up to the back of the taxi, and standing on his tippy toes, opened fire through the back window. Now, according to newspaper accounts, the first shot hit Dropper in the back of the head. He fell against Detective Joseph and muttered, Jesse, they got me. The second shot hit the driver behind the ear, and the third went through Captain Williams' hat. His wife was the first to react. She pounced on Cohen and yelled, don't shoot him, as she clawed his face. He pushed her off and, and kept firing. Another two shots, one plowed into the dropper's back and one that went wild. After the second shot, Mrs. Kaplan was on Cohen again and there were a number of cops who practically carried Cohen into the courthouse. Mrs. Kaplan ran over to her husband and grabbed the sleeve and cried. Tell me you weren't what they say you were. She didn't get his answer. A few minutes later, he was placed in an ambulance and died en route to Bellevue. Now, it, it should be noted that Kaplan's death certificate doesn't back up the newspaper accounts of the shooting. The certificate said that he was shot through the lung and doesn't mention any head wound. Now, after the shooting, the police went through the crowd and arrested some of little Augie's henchmen and a little Augie. All right. Cohen insisted that he wasn't a part of any gang and he acted on self-defense. He said the dropper had been hounding me for some time. Two weeks ago, he wanted to shake me down for $500. When I told him I didn't have it, he said he had me bumped off. Then he went on to say that the dropper had his best friend killed a few days prior. He barely escaped from Kaplan and some of his henchmen. The dropper's wife responded in the press and said, he's a liar by the book. 
the kid and I were upstate at a hotel two weeks ago at the very time this liar says my husband tried to jip him out of that $500. The kid wasn't anywhere near Cohen in his life. Cohen never saw him before. He had to have his gang point the kid out. That's how much he was jipped of $500. Cohen stuck to his story and took the rap alone. Little Augie and his men were released. And that there, my friends, is the straight dope. The skinny on Johnny Spanish and Nathan Kid Dropper Kaplan. Hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. All right? Now let's get to this contest, okay? I promise you guys I'd give you a contest. So here it is. I want you to pick one year between 1900 and 1950. All right? Put your number down, down at the bottom. The person who put the closest number to the number that I have will win the T-shirt, okay? You're going to win the, the AFBM, the main page shirt, all right? The one you see on the main page of my, of my YouTube, okay? So listen, guys. Make sure you go down and check out the merch store. The link is below in the description. Follow me on Instagram at AFBM underscore gear. Make sure you like, subscribe, share the video, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss next week's episode, okay? This has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I'll see you guys next time.